Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Sean Taylor from Contra Brand. And I was just telling him earlier, I've been watching some of his um, his YouTube videos, his TikToks, his... Uh, his course material. And I feel like I I know him already, which is, is, which is always fun. Like, I love that about being able to learn from people. And I feel like, you know, people come to me and say like, I feel like I know you because I've listened to your podcast for six years. And that's just something that's really fun about the internet. Cause of course we've never met, but um, I would love to know a little bit more about your background, Sean. So if you could let us know kind of how you got into working in the music industry and how you kind of started your online persona and, and brand and how it kind of grew to where it is today. All right, sure. Well, first, if you've been doing a podcast for six years, man, God bless you. Actually but seven years. <laughs> that's crazy. A lot of people are just now getting on the bandwagon. Right. Having, um, but me, I'm one of those people who never ever saw themselves in the music industry, period. I uh, started off more on the tech side, computer programmer for college. That's what I went to be. And then ended up more on the computer information side, information side, worked in the tech startup world for a while. And the way I got into music was literally just me helping out some friends who were artists for fun. They wow. yeah, were throwing events around town, trying to build their brands. And then there was also some DJs in the, in the group. And I was the one guy who didn't want to be seen, right? <laughs> so I'll just, you know, help, right? Do all the things in the background. But I love business. Always, always loved business, entrepreneurship, the idea of it before. You know, I'm probably like the last generation um, before the entrepreneurship was sexy. Like still mm-hmm. in the 90s, it really wasn't like all the way there yet. Right now it's everybody on the, on the magazines and everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. But I, so I knew back then, even though my mom was like, nope, you're going to, to be a big corporate guy. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to be a big corporate guy. Um, not that way, right? Not the traditional school route. Um, so but combining that, me always taking the business approach to things, I really started to feel in, in the marketing um, space for them because that was the, the big need that was required. And long story short, I ended up coming up with this really cool festival concept because, you know, as a group of friends, it was like going down the line, oh, it's your turn for an event, it's your turn for an event, your turn for an event. And then it got to me, like, hey, Sean, what you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm not here to be an artist or anything. So um, I came up with this really cool indoor festival concept called Adventure Time ATL. Um, now Adventure ATL, where the entire concept was to take entire uh, an entire building and make everything feel like its own experience. Every single room, there was an upstairs, downstairs. Uh, the downstairs felt like this really rave basement, smoky red light. You go in and this all, and it was like rave type artists down there, all right? And then there was an outdoor room where it felt all like neo soul like, and those type of artists were performing in that room. And then there was an art gallery and we opened up this secret room at the end of the night and it was this big glow party. This was like really, very, very, really high stimulation. To me, that was like my art form. So I was always an artist, but not that type of artist, right? The musician, but I've already always like saw the world through art architecture and architecture. So um, that event went very well. Word of mouth was crazy for it. I ended up doing it again because word of mouth was so crazy. And eventually people start finding out who was the guy behind it because it became a really big platform for artists in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, it was done so officially. It really felt like an event. 
from like some legitimate festival, right? And, my, and I, <laughs> on the other end, it was just kind of like me, right? Um, Self-funding it. Like the first one probably spent, I don't know, somewhere between, I think it was like $1,100 max. Um, wow. Yeah, and that was all the, I, it was no marketing spend the, at, at the beginning. I was just hacking social media, not even thinking about all the stuff I was doing at the time. Uh, because funny enough, right, even branding wise, like I, I was doing everything I would do now, like I did. <laughs> but it was like, I, because it was my time to do an event, I thought more of a party, but I had this big vision. And when I finally found space, a space that I thought could fit the vision of what I wanted to do, I was like, oh, snap. This place is too big to just bring out 100 people. I have to bring out way more people. And I can't attract that many people. I wasn't like some kind of really connected guy where I could just maybe bring out a thousand people just off of the strength of my name or throwing parties before. I literally never thrown a party, like even a <laughs> birthday party for myself before. Like I haven't. So I was like, I have to call it a festival. Festival sounds bigger, right? <laughs> and then everything just like snowball from there. Um, but yeah, uh, because of the way it was done, uh, it became a really good platform for artists and then they wanted to know who the, was the guy behind it and or who were the people behind it they actually thought it was my friends because it was I was so so behind the scenes and didn't want to talk to people and eventually people figured out it out because my friend was like that guy <laughs> and uh, I just started helping people out giving them my advice next thing you know I'm like ah, I don't want to talk to all of y'all um all the time especially answering this same questions over and over again i'll create some youtube videos and put them on youtube and then everything start you know <laughs> going viral from there essentially over time that is such a common story i mean that is how a lot of times people get into stuff like this is they don't they're asking they're answering the same question over and over again and i may as well make a video for it right i've heard that story a lot yep. and it's it's interesting that I think that's how people got started, quote, back in the day. I don't know that that's really how people do it now. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that people are more, um, they're more intentional about how they start like a YouTube channel or a TikTok or whatever? Not <laughs> that they were just like doing it to, to answer some questions that you keep getting over and over again. Yeah. I, it's 100 percent that today i've observed yeah. that because i always saw myself in particular the most commonly associated in my space um on youtube i'm like man i kind of just started this thing just to start it for fun but these other people started it to be a business and saw this as an opportunity yep. Yep. and i was kind of first because i guess that was before the opportunity was clear and i was just doing it for fun but i remember being maybe about eight months in and you know, there's always haters in the comments. And I remember this one guy specifically was like, yeah, he's just doing this um, and giving this free advice because he wants um, you to like buy his products or do, or do business with him at some point. And I was like, whoa. I don't even have a business. Like, should I have a business? Like, should I be selling a product? I was, I wasn't thinking anything like that at the time. To, to like candidly speaking, I was. Like I was pretty deep into music or at least the YouTube side of it before I even honestly decided to commit myself to the industry. I was still foot in on the tech industry, foot in on the music. And I'm like, man, there's so much more money over here. And, and things made a lot more of sense. You know, the music industry from anybody outside of the music industry does not make sense. Nope. <laughs> I, right? I don't know. People in the music industry, so, still, so many things to me are just like, why is it like this? Right. <laughs> Why are there so many royalty streams that we don't even know how to collect as art? You know, there's just so many things that I'm just like, oh, if someone would have designed this from the beginning, they certainly wouldn't have designed it this way. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. So like that, it was, it was the, this, I, one, I, I completely agree. There's so many people who are very intentional these days and, you know, cool to the, um, it's, it's cool doing it that way too. I, that just wasn't my story. It was so organic and and yeah, um, largely due, especially to, to, uh, to like one, my natural tendency for love of like marketing, branding, business and music just happened to come together. And then two, 
yeah, having was seen and done what I had de- did even up to that point in tech and comparing it to what I was seeing in music. And it was just like, I don't know about this thing, man. Like, I just want to keep doing this for fun. I don't know. <laughs> I was very, very, very hard on actually committing myself and having my life depend on music. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally get that. And I I kind of have a little similar story in that I started my Women of Substance platform, which was an online radio station and then became a podcast. It was to elevate women, right? It wasn't in order to elevate myself in any way. It wasn't in order to, you know, have a lot of musicians then ask me a bunch of questions. You know, that's what happened organically for sure. Now, when I started my podcast, I absolutely was like, this is a platform where I, my goal is eventually to have a program where I help artists and this is how they can get to know me, you know? And so there was definitely that intention behind it, but it was also like, I'm being asked a ton of questions or I'm seeing artists who have amazing music, but how come no one's ever heard of them? How come I'm the only one that playing their, that's playing their music? And that's kind of how it grew into like, oh, I could actually have a business helping artists. Mm -hmm. So it's a little similar into what you did. And it was, you know, 2007, that was a long time ago when I started the the radio station. And and back then definitely didn't have any intention of like, I'm going to be working in this space in you know, 12 years or whatever. Near enough industry infrastructure to even have that vision. If you you had that thought... (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I'd be a lot richer than I am now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. For, for sure. Yeah. But I, funny enough, I actually didn't even commit, even when I did the YouTube channel to, to just music, right? At first, you know, I'm doing these questions due to the artists and making those representations, but I like kind of just pop using pop culture to explain, um, business in any any, um in in any sense right so i was like i'm gonna knock out these videos with artists and then i'm gonna move at some point or at least add like more psychology in general and these other aspects of tiers of business um but i never got around to it like i still (laughs) (laughs) have videos i'm sure as a content creator you have like listing of ideas that you've never created and then you lose that list and then you do another hundred ideas you lose that list again (laughs) That's funny. Well, and I think that, you know, being that your brand was brand man, right? Like that clearly wasn't specifically for musicians, right? Was it? No, not at first. That's what I thought. It was Sean Taylor at first. That was my YouTube channel. It was just my name. Like I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. I was on the slideshow. You couldn't see my face. It was like just voiceovers. Mm. Like, um, I I don't, yeah, I didn't have a Mac at that point. So it was just Excel, PowerPoint. Um, and I did all my thumbnails in PowerPoint and screenshotted it because I didn't know how to do graphics. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. H- how did you um, move into eventually like selling courses and deciding that you're going to actually serve people in that niche? Like what was the, I mean, other than hearing from that hater and and that actually sparking an idea, which is is pretty funny, but like what what was the first thing you did that actually you made money in that space? Yeah, so the first thing I did was consultations mm-hmm. because um, it was just I could work with people, right, and talk to people and help them like build out their marketing. So it was specific or uh, really custom. I didn't see myself as someone who could just create some kind of course. I don't even I wouldn't even think in that deep, but I wouldn't mm. even have like tried to sell a course right at that time because I'll always sell off of things that I know and I'm really comfortable with so I wouldn't have built that out and and tried to sell that kind of thing um like everything I've done has been about trying to solve a problem Mm -hmm. so you know to have the channel oh yeah let me talk to some of these people see people really seem like they have problems and they would like my thoughts and I'm curious so I'll talk to people and I would help them I would go build out a plan and work that way and then after a while I really got tired of talking to people and then they disappear and I don't know what happens right mm. like I make a little bit of money off of these consultations like $50 or something it would you know whatever maybe it was like really deep it would be $600 max at the time it would like really build out a plan and but it was just like yeah like it feels like I'm using my time but I don't have any attachment to the results I'm not clear 
if I'm helping somebody or if I'm spending my time with somebody that's actually going to take mm. it. And it just wasn't enough for me. All right. And that was when I eventually built Brandman Network, the, the back end space, which became, you know, courses on demand, mem um, subscription membership style. And, and I built it workshop week to week where I could kind of talk to people with like class, uh, like in cohorts and like really help them do their progress, help them think through the topics and processes. Uh, that was the, evolu the evolution of that. And that was why I did that. Cause I was like, okay, we can have a community too. I can have a lot more accountability so I can truly help people, right? And get progress there. And then at some point I just felt like I was hitting the ceiling knowledge wise to the ambition that I wanted to be able to help people so that's when the agency came because I didn't want to do an agency I didn't want to do the agency <laughs> didn't want to do the music industry I fought that for a while and I fought doing any kind of agency for a while so I'm like man it's a lot of work it's high labor and as a business entrepreneur person like I've, I'm, I've always been like a huge like business model geek <laughs> and before getting into like a, a agency, I just recognized like that is a high intense, low margin, <laughs> heavy work model, right? Because I come from tech too, where you'll have a company of 50 people sell for a billion dollars. <laughs> right? It's just like, I was so, so used to different, uh, just, it was just an awakening, right? But I really wanted to make sure that what I was doing was a day to day, I'm grinding it out and I understand the problems that I was trying to solve and what I was talking to people about. So I partnered with my um, partner, Ja'Cory, and we we built out the agency um, over the last three years. It's had you know, some pretty major successes. Um, we got a billboard number one, quite a few people going viral on TikTok or you know, building out their first fan bases, all those cool things that you want to happen in the music industry. But everything has been, you know, you go through the experience, you see a problem, right? Even my festival was a part, the concept was built off of me going to clubs because I was still like pretty fresh in the college era at that moment. I would go to clubs, right? Then by maybe end of sophomore year, it's like, man, these clubs are always all like very similar and not too stimulating. People are just standing around. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the art world in Atlanta and it was like, because these guys are like so anti-club, <laughs> but if you go, it was like, this is just the same club vibe with art on the wall, All right? Like people still aren't engaged, they're not stimulated. So that was a part of a, uh, me solving a problem when I created my event to like, actually care about the attendees. Cause so many people just wanted people to show up cause you got your promoter's fee, right? <laughs> cause people showed up, you got your door um, or you're getting your drink uh, money or, or as an artist, you're just getting people to come see you. I didn't have that. I wasn't an in front of the scenes person. So I wanted to make sure people had the best time and all my details went into stimulating them again and again, the best way. And that's why the event had so much going on. I mean, it was such an experience. I marketed it as like Disney world for, for like 20 somethings or something like mm. crazy. Like that. Um, so, but everything is solving a problem. Like the next, the things I have in my mind now, as far as where my company is going is all about yeah, we experienced this, this is inefficient or this isn't as, as effective as I would like it to be. So how do we go to the next level by solving the next problem? Yeah, and I think that that's really how you stay in touch with how you can help people. And I love that you're very community-based. That's something we have in common. I have always had a community since 2015 is when I started with a community around women. And I just think that's really the best way to stay in touch with what they need, as well as to be able to not just be, you know, you're not the only solution for them. Like you can bring them together and help and encourage them to help each other in different ways and, you know, inspire each other as well. And I know that you're, you're doing that within your community, which is, which is awesome. And I definitely wanted to have you on here to talk about TikTok because I've been getting a lot of questions about TikTok. I've been, someone who's been dragging my feet a little bit about getting on TikTok, um, you know, I've been doing Instagram reels and stuff like that. 
But I know that when I talked to, um, you know, someone in your company about it and I was like, well, you know, I have a, a bit of an older audience, um, <laughs> you know, so how do you feel that TikTok fits for an audience, let's say, you know, even 45, 50 and over as far as artists, mm -hmm. is that still somewhere that they should be? Yes. So people probably get tired of me reciting this stat, but there's over. <laughs> billion people on Spotify on TikTok right mm -hmm. already that alone you gotta assume like that's not all young people uh, and then over 75 percent of their people uh, users have said they discovered new artists on TikTok mm -hmm. it's like 150 million people which is over double the amount of people on Spotify period so more people are discovering music on Spotify on TikTok than they are Spotify all right now again out of that 750 million got to be some old people on there now <laughs> like just that simple right now the same thing comes to mind when people say is my genre on there yes your genre is on there because if it's on spotify well there's way more people on tiktok right the people the interest is there it's just you understanding how to communicate to your audience whether, and whether that's an older demographic or a genre that might not be as popular of course you'll see on the front end what the brand is marketing you know, young or more popular music at first, but those things evolve over time as well because the platform's maturing. So yes, 100% it started in a young demographic, but TikTok as a company doesn't just want young people on there because they can't grow as much, right? They can't market themselves as for families and, and all these other things. So yes, uh, TikTok is a space for all. We've used, we've used like, all grandmas and campaigns before right <laughs> like they they because they were already on there and they're popping right they have big audiences on tiktok uh, one of our clients macy gray has like a very very strong um like page in terms of her engagement and the people who are involved with her there and and most of those people right are from an older generation they're not you know tweens at the moment so it's it's there but of course it then becomes, how do you reach them on there? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. How, what do you encourage artists to look at within themselves to figure out what they should be amplifying on TikTok to bring in the right people for them? All right. So one, you have your music and the substance with that, it, that it contains. All right, focus on that. And then what are your other interests? Your other interests naturally are going to resonate with people who are most like you already, right? Mm -hmm. They're only going to get the inside jokes that you get, all right? Because they, they saw this movie from whatever era in space. So if you figure out one, how to make sure you stick to substance in your music and expand on that. Just don't try to market the song, but like, what did I mean when I wrote this song? I, I wrote it, it had a meaning. It was a story behind it. Actually share that. And, and then when, then on top of that, you add two or three different subjects that you kind of like to touch on, whether that's makeup, whether that's makeup for specific event types of events, right? It can really, you can really niche down from there. Or whether that's like books, um, quilting, all those things, like people who aren't artists and I'm just quilting, uh, they have really strong audiences. So it's how do you present yourself as not only an artist, if you are an artist, right, but also um, just find an interest that you don't mind sharing, because that's the last thing. Keep in mind that when you share this thing, you can end up amplifying a message that you might not want to continue to do. And it's cool to do that here and there, but like, if you do it consistently, it's going to become a part of your brand naturally. Uh, I strategically don't talk about a lot of stuff I know because I don't want to be asked about it. Mm. <laughs> All right. So show the side that you want people to resonate with and that you want those type of people to show up because you have multiple layers and it's and whatever you want to attract it's probably a part of you already um, and and just be consistent in, in that space 
Yeah. And, and I think that, like you said, though, whatever you talk about, you will attract. And so make sure that you actually want to talk about that thing. So how do you, where's that point where you um, switch over from like, okay, now I have an audience and I can talk to them about whatever I want versus I need to talk about these specific things because I'm actually trying to attract people to my account. That phase can begin as early as you successful formats with those intentional subjects that you choose in the beginning. And what I mean by that is TikTok is a platform that's built on formats and everybody's viral formula is not the exact same viral formula. Overall, you wanna achieve the most watch time as possible. You wanna get as many replays as possible, all right? Um, maybe it's a, a, a replication type video, you want as much replication as possible. But how you get people there is no different than the fact that there's a lot of different movies and they have a lot of different stories in between. You know, we can go through some common tour, uh, threads, but the style that those stories are introduced is different. And TikTok is a storytelling platform. So um, the format is what you need to understand first. So what that would look like is Covers are successful, but what is the style of cover that works for me? Uh, the most common example that I like to use is a guy said, what if this song, and he'll play the song, was R&B, and he will take a popular song and change it to R&B, right? And that format worked very well for him. But once you have that format, let's just say your own format for, for doing covers, that's cool. And then people will post another video and say, oh, nobody wants to hear me do uh, play my original music or talk about makeup. Well, it's not that TikTok is built off of the formats and you mastered this format, mm -hmm. right? If you did another cover in a completely different style, that other cover probably wouldn't do as good as well. So you gather a format around the intentional things, or intentional subject plus format that works for it after you test through it. Now, what's the next intentional subject and how, what works through that? And you stay consi uh, consistent with the things that are working and then you go experiment with something else right here and there until you find a format that works for that thing or you just decide ah, okay maybe this thing isn't going to work for me and you find another subject that you want to add on but it's about formats more than it is about like i got this amount of many followers or something like that right so you kind of look at the format as like a, a, a series right so it's like okay i'm doing this this format of like what if this song was done in this style right and that's like a format for me. And then I were to do, you know, a whole bunch of those. Right. But you don't want to just do that. Right. Cause then people will get bored. So then you have to add another format. Is that what I'm hearing you saying? Yes. But I'd like to add the caveat that we get bored with ourselves usually. before. <laughs> Good <whatever>. point. <laughs> so you probably want to go past your threshold a little bit more and remember that other people don't see, you know, see you yet. So you could just really, really, really triple down on one single format and just be doing covers or just be doing whatever you choose before you try, uh, decide to explore something else, like and do it until you get to the hundreds of thousands Mm. even millions depend on how far you really want to go with it yeah I don't know I mean I agree and not everybody is going to see every single one of the ones that you do right but I do I did notice that like I'm following somebody and every single TikTok that I see that she does is skit style and every time I'm just like oh, this again you know what I mean so you do have to kind of change it up a little bit I would think Otherwise, yes. people are just going to be like, oh, it's just another skit. That's over time, though, right? Like, that's, right. So, and where that threshold is a little subjective because we experience this with anybody who's big in general, right? Like, the more people, like, oh, I mastered this format in my comedy or whatever I'm doing, and I got my early adopters. I just really start to find my, my space in this formula and I got to keep doing this mm. for the masses and all these new people are coming in while the old people are like, eh, I've seen that already and kind of wanting to move on. So it's like, how do you add layers throughout? And that's the common problem. That's always going to be the, the, the thing, right? No matter what you're doing, even before TikTok, social media, how do you continue to add other layers to your brand 
to make sure people continue to be interested. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't say that that uh, young lady is probably like, uh, she has no chance to keep you interested, right? It, like, it seems like you're watching her enough, you're saying this again, but you're still in the space where you That's will be true. <laughs> something else, right? So it sounds like it might be time for her to, to start experimenting with those other formats. And that's, and it, this is truly the difficulty, right? Cause it's like, how fast can you get another hit? Whether you're creating music, whether you're creating a TV mm-hmm. show is like, okay, I have my one. Now can I, now I got to spend attention to um, make my next plate spin. And then we know the stories of the people who rely too much on that one. And they had a moment in time versus a career. And then we know the people who spread too much too thin and they never really, you know, got to as high of a ceiling that gave them the space to create a, a career. So it's, it's, it's a, it's hard to answer that, answer that from a general blanket statement, but it's definitely the, the, the problem of, of the ages. <laughs> yeah. It's a balancing act. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so are there particular formats of TikToks that work well for music artists versus, you know, the average TikToker? Yes. This is so crazy because I um, I see this on TikTok now and so much more intentionally than it used to be. And it was something that I marketed. I have a, a video on YouTube talking about doing covers and the best way to do covers. And that actually marketed, uh, broke down a lot of how people find successful covers on TikTok now, which is simply switching up the style, right? Or creating an element of, of, of surprise. So that's, I'm a R&B artist singing this country song, right? Mm -hmm. Either I'm making this country song R&B or I've established an R&B audience and I surprise them with singing the country song that they don't expect me to sing. And I do it even kind of in a country style, Mm -hmm. right? It's the element of surprise or I'm this really young kid who has this big voice that people don't expect or... I'm this like young white girl who's singing this really hood hardcore rap song, right? There's always this polarization of unexpectation and I'm either rapping the lyrics like them or I'm taking those lyrics and singing it. And I just don't fit the space, the the, the face that people would imagine when they first hear it. So however you can do that, right? I could change it into EDM. I could change it from EDM to um, another genre, or I can add lyrics to a song that doesn't have lyrics. I can take a song that was done from a female's perspective and create a male response, right? And add to the story. It's literally just providing a different POV of the exact same thing that already has success. That's one of the best ways when it comes to covers or using some remix of what's already done even when it's a trend it doesn't even have to be a cover you literally just take what people already know and add a different pov Hmm. so with tiktok is it really important to hop on whatever the current trends are no um uh, you can use trends to you know accelerate some attention to yourself at times but you can easily accelerate the wrong attention <laughs> you know, I, I know people say there's no such thing as bad press and all those things. You know, I, I, to me personally, the verdict's still out on that. But the you can definitely attract an audience and get yourself in an algorithmic hole <laughs> that's hard to get out of, mm-hmm. right? Because I went viral for some trend and everybody followed me, and I literally never want to do anything like that. And I barely even know why that video went viral in the first place, <laughs> right? Um, so you you can use trends especially if you get good at it and and figuring out how to like flip that into your voice and perspective in a way that does make sense and feel authentic to you um and how you want to represent yourself but be very selective on the trends you you choose and we have plenty of people you know find themselves growing and blowing up without hopping on a specific trend it's just about feeding the algorithm the formats that it likes and that format is ultimately dictated by your audience and Mm. and the watch time associated with it that's good to know because i mean there's something in me that just like wants to not do the trends because 
I don't know. I, I don't want to have to be constantly keeping up with the Joneses. You know what I mean? Yes. That's why I, that's why on, um, I stopped doing my, my YouTube channel to a certain extent. Right. I, I do it, but at a, a certain phase, I was using a lot of popular artists cause I was really interested in, uh, and I felt like that was a great way to communicate it. But at a certain, after a while, you know, new music and all these new artists popping up some of them I wasn't even necessarily interested in and then people wanted me to get more into some people wanted to hear more news like stuff and that news thing I was like no I'm not going to have to like it just be dictated my whole life is dictated by what else is being talked about and I have a, a, a problem spending a lot of energy and time on something I don't even think is relevant like oh this is so stupid why do I have to talk about it so <laughs> a trend would be the same thing, all right? And so it, it goes back to what we've said, right? Like talk about the things that you wanna put out. And I saw more than anything, when I started my YouTube channel, you literally attract what you put out. Like my now wife had to like say the obvious to me. Like when one day I was like in a car, she was driving and I was like, we're going scrolling through my like DMs. I'm like, what? why do these people keep asking me these questions? Like, they don't even know me. And she was like, well, isn't that what you talk about online? I was like, oh, I guess that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was early on, I'm like, why do they keep asking me these questions? Like, <laughs> so like, it, 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 what you put out is literally what you get in today's era with the algorithms, especially. Yeah, I, I think that's funny that you said that about the news because I feel the same way. I go on TikTok and I see all these people are talking about like whatever the newest music industry news is. And I'm like, do I have to do that? I don't want to do that. Like that stuff actually really doesn't interest me. And I kind of want to be more outside of the music industry. But I think when you go in there and you you see what people are doing, you have this feeling of like, I need to do that. Right. And so do you have any suggestions of like, how do you find inspiration for what you want to do without feeling like you have to do what other people are doing one start with content that inspires you right mm -hmm. something that you would like to know or like to see and then two don't limit your examples and inspirations to your space mm -hmm. right like i had a a, a content workshop to help artists with music videos and things like that where i explained where you don't have to just look at the other rapper the other pop star country star and that's similar to you and try to do that you can look outside of the space right bring something new into the space so you're a country artist you're looking at what the rappers are doing and then you figure out how to integrate that into your space and your voice and now you're differentiated from your own uh own lane right you're because you are in the lane you have to figure out how to separate yourself and be uh be of your own in that lane so like looking at other spaces and content like i'll go like when it comes to like creative i, I did a lot of creative direction um earlier on just because i was in more music for art the artist side of me and i mean i would look at anything from japanese game shows right <laughs> like like seriously, everything like rock, like soft rock from the early eighties, like rock has a lot of really cool, interesting, uh, like ideas the way they approach their videos, um, like commercials, like Dove has this series of commercials that I always go refer back to. It's like a, uh, it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a commercial about beauty, but they did a lot of a whole series, but um, one of them was like the, about beauty and it would be this guy who's the the artist the sketch artist like if you are trying to identify a criminal or something oh yeah uh-huh right so let's say you would have there's a sketch artist and he's sitting and he's asking you how do you look describe your features and he would draw everything you say and then he would ask me hey sean how does brie look and i would describe your features and he would draw both pictures and then the way you would think you look would be way uglier than what I would say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a really interesting thing, right? Um, really, really great series, stuff like that. Like, and how can you relate that type of conversation and that positioning, right, of that concept to your audience, right? So many ways 
you can take those type of ideas and bring it into your own um, your own audience. I, I flipped a, I've, I've done that with many things, like many things, um, and 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 you can do that with your own um, your own content. Like so, again, don't be inspired by just the people in your lane who are already doing it or think that that's the way it has to be done. You might copy some of that formula just to give yourself some traction so you have enough of an audience, right? And they know who to compare you to, right? Now you're positioned, but then you can innovate by bringing things from outside that lane to in that lane. Right? And that's what people like Kanye do all the time. Like, you know, I was fortunate. I had a really artist driven background and sister was in ballet and I'm like really I'm the kind of type of guy that I just love people who are great at what they do mm. right I don't care if it's a man if it's a woman I don't care if it's ballet I don't care if it's like rapping it could be plumbing like when people are like really really good and, and they're so geeked out about their thing I love when people are passionate and geeked out about the thing they do and I find them very interesting so like I would see Kanye do certain things that you know I feel like a lot of people sometimes would like be like oh this is so amazing and innovative and I was like oh he took that and put it there right like he's just doing the same thing but they had never seen the thing ever but I've seen the thing and I know where it was pulled from it's, it's like being a kid hearing certain music the first time and then your the adults are like oh they sampled this song or they copy x y and z and right. you're like you're doing it right <laughs> it's the same thing right so um like that but that's the formula right taking things from other places and inspiring that most great artists do that no matter like what kind of artist not even music just visual whatever you'll see them having a big horde of materials they literally pulled and saved from trips they've taken places and then they build something new out of it all right so that that's truly the formula of innovating and of course if you grab the things from other places that you like then of course you won't have to worry about being trapped in this box of, uh, you know, inauthenticity. Yeah. I love that perspective. And I'm, I've been trying to do that myself, you know, look at other TikTokers that aren't in the music space and mm -hmm. things that interest me. And then like, how can I pull some of that into the music space? And like, how can I look at what's going on in my space and see the gaps and where I can fill in the gaps? Yep. That's it. That's yep. really that simple. Yep. I, I think it's just, it's a combination of like filling in the gaps and doing the same thing that other people are doing in a little bit of a different way, but also, you know, something that's not so out there. Like you said, things that will, people will recognize and it will help you build your audience a little bit at first. And mm -hmm. then you can kind of go outside the box a little. Yep. But you have to be willing to not see an immediate success and go through an experimentation phase all right mm -hmm. but you but it's so helpful it, and it's it, because people only come to others for a pov that's what makes an artist unique like the best artists you can kind of mimic how they would see things like i could write a lyric and say it like this person i could write a lyric and say this person would say that you're it's the same way that you can mimic your mom to your siblings or something, right? Or your cousin. <laughs> and they know, oh yeah, that's how that person talks. It's their point of view, their way of doing things. And that's what you're trying to get out to the world when you, as an artist, especially a lasting artist, that's when, when you're peel, there's some artists that get big songs, but their actual point of view don't, doesn't connect because they didn't put it out there. It might be more manufactured and they have more trouble lasting. Somebody like you, right? They'll listen to your stuff and other people in your space also but still and, and, and as a matter of fact it'll be on the exact same subject something can happen in music and they want to hear everybody because they want to hear what you think about it and how you think about it right so the point of view is the most important thing out of all of this mm, I love that I love that perspective um yeah I mean that's so related to the artist branding and um, kind of like the way I like to talk about it is connection points between you and your audience and the things that, like you said, why are they going to want to come and hear your opinion about something? Because they do, they're interested in your point of view. And, and a lot of times it's either because you guys have things in common and they want to know what you're thinking about that subject because they're going to identify with that. 
You know, some people want to hear a person's point of view because it validates their point of view. And some people want to hear a person's point of view because it's very different from what they're used to, but they're wanting to like open up their perspectives, right? So it's kind of two different ways, two different reasons to care about someone's point of view. That's very true. I'm actually usually the latter. Uh, I like to try to go find stuff that sounds different, right? Mm. But try not to fall into that bucket of people who watch videos and just to be angry at them. I don't get those people. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, those people exist. They're like both, like all of that. I'm, I'm, but, they, but the, but the important part is right. They're looking for a point of view. Right, and some people just want to hear a point of view that's going to validate them and make them feel like they're part of a community that thinks the same way too. And I think there's value to that as well. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. There's plenty of people changing the news channels until they finally hear what they want. <laughs> right. <laughs> this one, this is the one right here. <laughs> yeah, this is going to tell me what I want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, so let me ask real quick about hashtags. Are hashtags used the same way on TikTok that they are on other platforms? And should, should artists be using hashtags when in, in, their, um, in their captions and stuff? It's a great question. From the standpoint of organization, yes, right? Meaning, you know, you can go to a hashtag and find anything that was put under that hashtag. So you can create a hashtag around all of your music. And then, I don't know, Brand Man Sean Music will have all my music. And then Brand Man Sean Advice will have all my advice. Mm. But when it comes to helping virality, that is not there in the same way that it was with Instagram. Mm. So I encourage everyone and if you use a hashtag make sure it's highly relevant to what you're actually putting out and leaving it at that if not you can literally not use any hashtags at all and go mm. super viral on, on tiktok right the hashtags is not the thing so don't have a post with 12 different hashtags it's not helping you and in some cases people will look at you a little funny um <laughs> had one i had a person use a ukraine as an hashtag when the video had nothing to do with ukraine oh, it was no. just search reviews it's like oh man why'd you do this and it's like oh well it's too late i tried to delete it after people complained about it but you know you can't edit and i was like man i <laughs> wish you didn't do that it just doesn't make sense right so just keep your hashtags relevant it will not help you all right do not take instagram mentality and bring it to tiktok it's it's a different universe over there. <laughs> what, what, what do you think are the main ways that it's different? All right. So one hashtagging, all right, just okay. literally keep it relevant. The way they, they identify, they can use your captions, what you hashtag more so to inform the algorithm, mm -hmm. right? Who you should be shown to. Right. So imagine you use these words like cats, and then all of a sudden you get shown to a lot of cat lovers in the videos about like dogs or something, right? <laughs> of course there's crossover, but you know what I mean? It could be something far more extreme that really there's no relation, but you're telling the algorithm to like show you to irrelevant things. That's what you're doing when you're doing irrelevant hashtags and all that stuff. And you don't want to tell the algorithm that because when it shows it to people, to, to the irrelevant space, that watch time is going to be very low which means it's not going to be shown to more people. Oh no, I don't have any views, right? So that's what I mean about the hashtag situation. Um, also, it's built off of the, TikTok is built more on the interest graph versus the social graph. And the social graph is what we, why we call them social networks, right? That's the initial thought that was put out hey, you're my friend and I might know your friends and we'll probably have similar interests because we're all friends, right? And slowly but surely things snowball from there. We build our friend networks and we see things that are related to people that we, that we know or from people we know. TikTok, you're like, why am I seeing this stuff, right? Like there is no logic from that standpoint. It's more about what you've trained the algorithm that you... Um, to respond to, or better, better said, you've trained the algorithm um, to say, hey, these are the things that 
Sean best responds to. Sean will stay on the platform longer if I show him these type of videos. It doesn't matter who his friends are, right? It's almost like the other social media platforms are, what's the word? It's, it's like, like going to school, going to college, going to work, like your true social groups, mm. right? And how you think. And then TikTok is showing you the stuff that you might not tell other people you watch. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit akin to a search engine, right? Like Google knows what I've searched for. Yes. And right. So it's kind of the same thing in that you are, it's going to reward whatever it is that you have been watching or been looking for and give you more of that. 100%. It's, it's truly, that's the biggest um, difference, right? It is a combination of a search engine and how Spotify's algorithm works at the same mm -hmm. time, all right? Whereas you can have an old video that begins to take off and it almost gets essentially playlisted in the platform. Yes, and it's just like Discover Weekly, right? I love that. I love that about TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's very cool. Very cool. Man, we've covered so much stuff. We're like hitting almost the hour mark. So I don't want to go on too much longer. Um, but I, this has been really, really helpful. I hope anyone in our audience that maybe thought, oh, TikTok isn't for me or it's for the young people or whatever, we have convinced them otherwise. Um, so let everybody know here, how can they find you on TikTok? How can they find you on YouTube? All that stuff. Type in brand man, Sean, that's S-E-A-N, not those other, you know, imposters. <laughs> and you will find me on all platforms. Nice. You got that. You got that handle on everything. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's so useful. I know. I love it. Um, I, for the longest time, Facebook was not allowing me to change my page name when I like oh. changed my, I like changed to a, like an umbrella brand of profitable musician and it was not letting me change my name. And it was so frustrating. And finally we were able to get it to change the name. I'm not sure what they had against it. I guess they they thought, you know, it, profitable musician is like saying somehow it's telling them something that they can they can have or you know how Facebook is about that. So it's very frustrating when you can't have the name that you need to be known under. So you're very lucky that you came up with something that you got to have across the board all this time. I am lucky. I'm very <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy to find you. And I, I have already definitely connected with you on TikTok. Um, Thank you so much for all of this advice on TikTok. I know you've got even way more and um, we're going to be bringing you in to talk about that to my audience, which I'm super excited about. Um, but thank you so much. And everyone that listens to this, go, go try out TikTok a little bit. See what it's like. Like you don't have to jump into the deep end of the pool. Just be on there. That's another thing that I know that you said that I think is so important is be on there as a consumer and spend some time on there every day. So you know, what's, what people are doing on there, what people are liking, and you're not kind of creating in a bubble. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate you giving your time today to, to educate our audience about TikTok. Thank you, Bree, for having me and everybody. Yes. Follow that advice. Hop on TikTok. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.